Previously on Patrick H. Willems. Uh, how was your vacation? I don't want to talk about it. The coconut? This is Charles. Charles? I felt like we needed some new supporting cast members. Hmm. Yeah, this is good. Huge improvement. This is weird. Why are we doing this? Look guys, I have a long list of ways to improve the channel this year. First two items on that list, Matt and Jake. Your personal branding, it's a mess. If we're all gonna be skinny white guys with facial hair, either we each have a distinct aesthetic, like modern X-Men, or we go for consistent uniformity, like classic 1960s X-Men. Pat, what's wrong with the clothes that I wear like every day? <sighs> everything, Jake, everything. Look, I have to go to a meeting right now. While I'm out, I want you each to brainstorm at least 15 potential catchphrases for yourselves. Okay, something like, uh-oh, it's Matt, but funnier. Why would you say uh-oh? Oh, what if we do striped shirts, but they're different colors? Jake, that is the kind of thing that I want to see. Keep it up. We're gonna look like Alvin and the Chipmunks. Oh, and by the way, here, while I'm out, uh, buy yourself some tasty treats. And um, I want like 15 ideas each by the time I get back. Do you think horizontal stripes make me look fat? He dropped something. It's a movie ticket. What movie? Seems like it's Star Wars, the new one. The date is December 19th, 2019. Why would he still have a ticket for that old thing? If I had to guess, I would say this is some sort of memento mori. Do you remember the night he came back from this very film? How sad and distraught he was, how miserable, stinking drunk, talking about how this film broke his heart? So you're saying, that this is why Pat's been acting so weird recently. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying. That whole vacation to Mexico where he comes back talking like he took a seminar from Ty Lopez. He has an imaginary friend Coconut with googly eyes. I think this film broke him. I think we should take a break. So that's it, I guess. Star Wars and I are done. Or we're, we're taking a break. I don't know, we're, we're hitting the pause button while I take some time to figure stuff out. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's weird that you're talking about your relationship with an intellectual property like it's a person, but come on. We're all fans of something. We've all got relationships with those somethings. We care. We can't help but care. Sometimes those things we care about, they let us down. They was the line. They go down a path we can't follow. Okay, top five things I'm gonna miss about Star Wars. Number one, that opening blast of John Williams' score, where even if the movie turns out to be bad, it starts out feeling like the best movie ever. Number two, Whenever a weird new puppet alien shows up and all the humans act like it's totally normal. Number three, chewy. Just being there, doing stuff, making Wookiee sounds. Number four, the jumps to light speed. When everything pauses and the stars stretch out and you realize that you breathe in every time it happens. And number five, I'm gonna miss the way Star Wars sounds that humming buzz of the lightsabers, the way Kylo Ren's has that little crackle, the way TIE Fighters scream as they fly in. Star Wars has the all-time best sounds in all of cinema. Over the years, Star Wars and I had our ups and downs, but two years ago, our relationship was the best it's ever been. I felt so optimistic about the future. Of course, not everyone did. The fandom split into factions, and it was clear people wanted wildly different things from Star Wars. I made a whole video about it, trying to understand how the relationship between a series of movies and its fans could change so dramatically. And then, over the past two years, my own relationship with Star Wars changed. 
Was it me? Was it Star Wars? What happened? I think the only way to figure this out is to look back over the past couple of years and see how things changed. So, in the words of our greatest modern poets, the band Coldplay, I'm going back to the start. Quick disclaimer. In this video, I'm going to occasionally say positive things about The Last Jedi, which I personally think is an excellent movie. Now, for some of you, that one opinion about one movie is a total deal breaker that renders anything else I might have to say irrelevant. In that case, I recommend you save yourself some time and just stop watching now. I promise, there's plenty of stuff on YouTube by people who share your exact opinions on Star Wars. Feel free to leave a comment on your way out about how I don't know anything about movies, and have a great day. Yeah. I like this movie. The Last Jedi was the Star Wars movie I didn't know I wanted until I saw it. It gave me all the stuff I generally want to see in a Star Wars movie. Space battles, lightsaber fights, all my favorite characters, funny droids and aliens. I mean, goddamn puppet Yoda shows up in this thing. But it didn't just recycle the greatest hits of the original trilogy. It had a new perspective on what Star Wars could be and what it could do. It felt aesthetically like a part of the series while bringing in new filmmaking influences. The end of this movie left us with Star Wars in a place it had never been before. With the main villain dead and in his place, a conflicted, complex character moving into the role of the central antagonist. With the primary hero moving beyond the old-fashioned ways of the Jedi and the binary light side, dark side concept, with the democratization of the Force and the idea that any one can be special, not just those descended from certain bloodlines. Star Wars was growing up and evolving, and man, I was so into it. That feeling lasted for about five months, and then, suddenly, there was another Star Wars movie. So soon? Yeah, it seemed weird. Solo, a Star Wars story, is less a Star Wars story and more a series of Star Wars answers to Star Wars questions that no one was really asking. Over the course of two hours and 15 minutes, the movie lets us know how Han Solo got his last name, how he met Chewbacca, how he met Lando, how he got the Millennium Falcon, how the Millennium Falcon got that little gap missing at the front, and what the Kessel Run is. I think the movie itself is... fine. It looks great, there's some fun stuff in it. I can't hate any movie with a train heist, but if you're only going to make one Star Wars movie every year or so, why is this the one you choose to make? This story could have been told as a novel or a comic book miniseries, or honestly, just an article on Wikipedia. But by making it a movie, the message it sends is that Star Wars is more interested in its past than its future. That it would rather fill in little gaps in its backstory than move forward. I'm honestly kind of relieved it wasn't a hit, because it saved us from getting a whole wave of prequel movies about young Yoda and young Tarkin and young Dexter Jetster. I mean, hey, we could have gotten a movie about sexy Sheev Palpatine having kids. We'll get back to that. When I hear people say The Mandalorian is the best thing to come out of the Disney era of Star Wars and shows why Jon Favreau should be put in charge of this franchise, I am just baffled. Like, totally, profoundly confused. Well, okay, I'm not really that confused because I think I understand. I just disagree. The Mandalorian is the kind of Star Wars story we always said we wanted to see about a bounty hunter kicking ass through the galaxy, meeting alien scumbags, exploring new planets in a time we haven't seen before. But, at least for me, it turned out to be a lot less exciting than I imagined. This all gets back to what we want from Star Wars, and The Mandalorian is exactly what a lot of people want. It's about a guy who looks just like Boba Fett, so he's basically Boba Fett, and he teams up with a droid who looks just like IG-88, so it's basically IG-88. And they protect a little baby Yoda, who's like Yoda, except he's a cute little baby. It's like a new paint job on the action figures you already have. The Mandalorian doesn't mess with the really important stuff. It doesn't touch any of the original characters or impact the grander story. It's like watching a Boba Fett action figure walk around classic Star Wars playsets. It's familiar looking stuff doing the badass things you always wanted to see. It's pressing those pleasure buttons that make you go, ah yes, 
This resembles that Star Wars feeling I enjoy. And I do sort of enjoy it, as like a travelogue through the galaxy. Much of the show reminds me of the Vader scene at the end of Rogue One. I said this in a video from two years ago, that it's like an HD remake of a PlayStation 1 game. It's stuff you recognize, doing what you expect, but shinier. And for a lot of fans, that's what they want. The Mandalorian is digestible Star Wars comfort food. Then, there's The Rise of Skywalker. If you liked this movie, that's awesome. I'm jealous of you. I so wish that I did. But watching this movie was the moment I realized Star Wars and I were not on the same wavelength anymore. This is not a video about why I think Rise of Skywalker is bad. If that's what you want, just go to the top of the page and type Rise of Skywalker bad into the search bar. You'll get plenty of results. Jenny Nicholson's video is pretty comprehensive. But putting aside that I think the writing and storytelling in this movie are subpar, that it's all plot and barely any actual story, I want to talk about what it does for Star Wars as a whole. This is a movie that has no new ideas and nothing to say. Every time it had to make a decision, whether it's what should be the main conflict, how the heroes should be rescued, or what the final scene should be, it had the same answer. Just do a thing we've seen before. The previous movie ended with a new status quo. Kylo Ren killed the wrinkly old bad guy on the throne, became the supreme leader of the First Order, and was now the main villain. Cool, right? Nope, the movie ditches all of that, puts Kylo right back to where he was two movies ago, and brings back the wrinkly old bad guy on a throne from the original trilogy. But didn't that guy get thrown down an energy shaft and explode, and then the whole space station he was on exploded into, like, tiny molecules? I guess that just doesn't matter. He's back with no explanation. We're just gonna do Return of the Jedi again because people liked that one. Okay, so how do we conclude Rey's journey of self-discovery? I guess we're just gonna reveal that she is related to that same wrinkly old bad guy, and that explains how she can do all the stuff she can do. But doesn't that totally undercut her growth from the previous movie as well as its core themes? Nope, that doesn't matter. All that's really important here is that we have a name that we've heard before. Okay, how do we save the day during the final battle? We bring back Lando Calrissian. How do we conclude Kylo Ren's arc of redemption? We bring back Han Solo. For the final scene of the entire nine movie saga, how do we end this? We're gonna have Rey go to Luke's childhood home, call herself Rey Skywalker, even though she only knew Luke for a few days, and then recreate the most famous shot from the original movie. But isn't Tatooine the place Luke hated and wanted to leave? Isn't it where Leia spent a few days as a slave to a giant slug? And what's Rey's relationship to this planet she's never been to? Hey, that doesn't matter. If the audience recognizes it, it's good enough. What J.J. Abrams does throughout this entire movie is mistake nostalgia for storytelling. He thinks just because the audience has an existing emotional connection to a character, or a location, or an image, then all you need for a successful movie is to string a bunch of those together. It's Star Trek Into Darkness all over again. Remember in that movie when Benedict Cumberbatch reveals that he's Khan, and the audience gasps because we know who that is. But then we realize that here, Kirk and Spock don't. They've never met him before, that name means nothing to them. And so the momentary emotional rush, because we recognize a reference, immediately reveals itself to be empty. So imagine if Return of the Jedi had ended with Luke traveling to Yoda's home planet, wherever that is, to bury Yoda's cane, and the final shot was him looking off at, I don't know, the ocean or something? Everyone in the audience would be like, what the fuck is this? What's this place? Why is that the final scene? And that's essentially what Rise of Skywalker is doing. If you strip away all the nostalgia for the audience, you're left with a meaningless scene for the characters. The one identifiable theme Rise of Skywalker has is the idea that we're not defined by our family legacy, and that we can choose a new family. So, why does the movie end with Rey, 
who has just wanted to belong somewhere her whole life, alone on a desert planet she has no connection to. This is the perfect time to underline that theme and show Rey together with the new family she has formed over the trilogy, but the movie is more interested in giving us that empty nostalgia hit. And what makes it even weirder is that according to multiple reports, Abram shot an ending that had Rey together with her friends, and then he scrapped it. Right to the end, he chose nostalgia over story. Rise of Skywalker is not about any ideas. It's not about the characters, it's only about Star Wars. What was exciting about Star Wars originally was the way it combined so many different influences. Westerns with samurai movies with pulp sci-fi adventure. Rise of Skywalker's only influence is other Star Wars. It's just recycling itself, turning into a human centipede cloaked in Jedi robes. Star Wars is supposed to be Luke Skywalker, looking out at the horizon, yearning to go out there and have adventures and new experiences. But over the past couple of years, Star Wars has felt more like if Luke had just stayed inside and played with his toys. George Lucas said it himself. In Disney CEO Bob Iger's recent memoir, he writes that when Lucas saw The Force Awakens, he felt betrayed. Not because it deviated from his plans for the characters, but because, in Lucas's words, there's nothing new. Iger wrote that, It was important to him to present new worlds, new stories, new characters, and new technologies. And over the past couple years, that's exactly what Star Wars hasn't done. We all know George Lucas loves it when stories rhyme. But there's a difference between rhyming and just repeating stuff we've heard before. But, Babu Frick, though, a legend. Now, what makes this all more complicated is the Colin Trevorrow of it all. A quick refresher in case you forgot, Colin Trevorrow, a director of Jurassic World and The Book of Henry, was originally set to direct and co-write Star Wars Episode IX. In September 2017, three months before The Last Jedi was even released, he and Lucasfilm parted ways, and a week later, it was announced that J.J. Abrams would be taking his place. Now, I've made it clear in the past that I'm not a huge Trevorrow fan, and I'm kind of ashamed of how happy I was when he left the project. But recently, I got a hold of a copy of the script he co-wrote with Derek Connolly for Episode 9, at least the draft that existed in December 2016. And while I have problems with it, I genuinely think it's better than what Rise of Skywalker ended up being. And the thing is, it's not just that it's a better, more functional piece of writing, it's that it actually continues and builds upon the ideas introduced in The Last Jedi. It tries to move Star Wars forward. Instead of spending the whole movie screaming Rey's name and saying he has to tell her something that he never ends up actually telling her, here Finn completes the arc he had been on over the past two films getting other stormtroopers to turn against the First Order, and leading an uprising of the lower classes on Coruscant. There's no Palpatine. Kylo Ren remains the main villain of the story, turning further toward the dark side. And Rey, who is also not related to Palpatine, moves beyond the old Jedi ways, becoming, as Leia puts it on page 39, something new. Even the fan service makes more sense. You know how some fans have spent decades complaining about how Chewie didn't get a medal at the end of A New Hope? Well here, he does get a medal at the end, but it's for his heroic actions in the Battle of Coruscant in this movie. In Rise of Skywalker, Maz Kanata just hands him a medal at the end for no reason. No one else gets a medal, just Chewie. I don't know exactly why Trevorrow left the project. Maybe Lucasfilm didn't like his script. Maybe they didn't get along with him. I don't know. But what I have here is a script that feels like a continuation and ending to the story that was being told across the trilogy. And instead, what got made was a movie that threw out all of that, that had no interest in moving forward, that ran off of pure nostalgia and an obsession with the past. I know Lucasfilm is a company within a massive media conglomerate, with tons of people working there, each with their own thoughts and opinions. 
I hate to ascribe one perspective to the whole organization, but all I have to evaluate here is what they chose to produce and release. And the message I take from their releases over the past two years is that, right now, Star Wars is only interested in recycling the past. It has no interest in moving forward. And that's not really what I'm interested in. Right now, it seems like Star Wars isn't really for me. I'm not a huge fan of the Star Wars prequels. I don't think they're very good movies, but I accept the general story developments. If you tell me that in Attack of the Clones, Anakin and Padme begin a secret forbidden love affair, and then a civil war breaks out in the galaxy, I'm like, sure, sounds cool. I may not like the execution, but I'm fine with what it adds to the overall story of the series. But it's different with Rise of Skywalker. The execution is obviously much better. The acting is better, the dialogue is better, the visual storytelling is better, Babu Frick is there. But in this movie, what are the main story developments? So it reveals that Palpatine is somehow alive and apparently has manipulated everything over the past 30 years. Also that Rey, who is really his granddaughter, can perform a ritual where he'll take over her body. But then she kills him and the Star Wars are over. The story over the past two movies has been about the resistance at war with the First Order. And this doesn't seem like an ending to that story. It just seems broken. Palpatine returning makes the original trilogy worse, because it takes away the impact of Vader's action at the end of Return of the Jedi. Now, him turning against Palpatine is essentially meaningless, since it didn't work. It makes Palpatine's character worse, since instead of a man consumed by his hunger for political power by any means necessary, he's just a wizard obsessed with a magic ritual. It makes Rey's character worse, because it undoes the idea that she can come from nothing and become someone great, instead attributing everything special about her to her bloodline, and it makes the entire saga feel smaller and insular, a story spanning a whole galaxy that's really just about two families fighting over decades. So when I think about this movie, how much I disagree with its major choices and the degree to which I think it damages the entire series, for the first time in my life, I don't accept what a Star Wars movie does. And I realize now that my entire relationship with Star Wars has changed. Bear with me on this tangent because I promise it will make sense. So I love superhero comics. The Marvel and DC universes are these wacky ongoing stories that have been running for decades, with countless writers and artists adding to them and building on each other's work. So the story of Spider-Man is this one story that's been going since 1962, and that one ongoing story is made up of thousands of smaller stories. And sometimes there's a story that you look at and just go, nope. In 2004, Marvel published a story across six issues of Amazing Spider-Man called Sin's Past. This story revealed that years earlier, Gwen Stacy, the love of Peter Parker's life, had an affair with Norman Osborn, aka the Green Goblin, who would famously kill her by throwing her off a bridge. And because of this affair, she secretly gave birth to twins who, because of Osborn's weird DNA, aged rapidly and eventually tried to kill Peter Parker and… whatever. It's a dumb story, so let's leave it at that. I hated this story. I think most people did. It felt like character assassination for Gwen Stacy. This girl who'd always been presented as a good person was now cheating on Peter with his friend's gross evil dad and having secret love children. Superhero comics might basically be soap operas, but this is a step too far. Now that story was published 15 years ago, and after I read it, I did what a lot of people did. I chose to ignore it. Sure, it might technically be a part of Marvel Comics canon, but personally, I don't acknowledge it as part of Gwen Stacy's history. When a character has been appearing in monthly comics for 50 years, you're going to get some bad stories that mess things up. And in those cases, the best thing to do is just to ignore it and brush it under the rug. And hey, maybe down the road another writer will come along and write a story that undoes it. That happens a lot in comics. And that, for me, is how I feel about Star Wars now. I'm not on board with this chapter in the story, so you know what? I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to move on with my life. There is a decent chance that I'm never going to watch Rise of Skywalker again. So what do I do now? 
Sure, I could spend the next year of my life obsessing over how much I hated The Rise of Skywalker. I could start a petition to remake it or to get Lucasfilm to wipe it from canon. I could make weekly videos detailing every little thing wrong with it. I could spend my days starting fights with people online who likes the movie because how dare they like a thing that I didn't. But that sounds like a really shitty, unhealthy way to spend my time. I'm an adult, and these are movies about space wizards intended for children. I care about them, and I take them seriously, but they're not worth staying angry about. I don't know. I heard this one time that anger leads to hate, and then hate leads to suffering, and no one wants that. So in this weird new post-episode 9 world, what is Star Wars? Is it one big series of nine movies? Is it a shared universe full of countless different stories? I honestly don't really know. We all want something different from Star Wars, and there's a Star Wars for whatever each of us wants. So we can each curate our own Star Wars experience. We can make our perfect Star Wars mixtape. Just the songs we love, none of the ones we don't, and hopefully, over time, we can add some new ones. For my whole life, the only Star Wars I cared about were the movies. But since lately the movies aren't really giving me the Star Wars experience I would like, I finally decided to branch out and dive into the animated shows. I've been watching The Clone Wars, and I just got to the part where it starts getting really good. Some of the recent Star Wars comics from Marvel have been great, and I'm really digging the new series by Charles Soule and Jesus Saiz. Maybe one day, the Star Wars I used to love will reappear. Maybe one day, destiny will bring us back together. If I'm being honest, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. But I'm okay with that. I'm back. How are those catchphrases coming? They're coming along real great. Hey, Patrick. Look, I know we never really talked about, uh, Star Wars. I mean, you doing all right? You wanna, you wanna talk about that? Is that why the erratic behavior's been happening? What? Star Wars? Dude, I got over that shit in like a week. I've moved on from those silly Space Wizards movies to more important, mature, sophisticated franchises. I mean, have you seen the F9 trailer? The only Han Solo I care about is Han Solo. Justice is coming. Salute me familia. Mm. Mm. What's that, Charles? You think I should talk about Skillshare? Do the ad read? Make that sweet money? Good idea. For the past half hour, I've been talking about how frustrating and disappointing it can be when movies prioritize fan service and nostalgia over storytelling. And look, Good storytelling isn't easy to do. You've got to work at it and study and educate yourself. And if you want to learn more about it, allow me to direct you to the Skillshare class called Storytelling 101, Character, Conflict, Context, and Craft by Daniel Jose Older. And here's the thing. Daniel Jose Older is one of the writers on the big new secretive transmedia Star Wars project called Project Luminous that's going to be announced next week. So, you can learn about the craft of writing from someone who's actually working on Star Wars. You can get access to this class and thousands more by joining Skillshare. The first 500 people to click the link in the description will get two free months of a premium membership. You can learn about writing, or video production, or even stuff like cooking in classes taught by experts and professionals. Most of these classes are under 60 minutes, with short lessons to fit any schedule. So in two months, you can fit in a lot of classes. So again, Join Skillshare at the link in the description for two free months. You get to learn new skills, it helps out the channel, everyone wins. Hello, welcome back, and thank you for watching what I think is the last Star Wars video I'm ever going to make. I can tell none of you believe me, but I really think this is it. I got everything I wanted to say into this one. Tomorrow on the second channel, if you didn't know we have a second channel, so go subscribe, my friend David Chen and I are doing a commentary discussion about this video, 
talking about how it was made and expanding on the topics brought up here. It's like a behind the scenes companion piece. We did this for the Zemeckis video and hopefully we'll do one for each new video, so be sure to check that out. Okay, some people to thank. Adam Lance Garcia for helping me shoot a bunch of this video and for being a script consultant and letting me bounce ideas off of him constantly for weeks while I tried to figure out what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you Brian Metolius for composing the amazing music in the opening scene. Thank you Dave Wiskus for helping me shoot the scene in the bar. And I want to thank the bar subject uh, that let us film inside. It's a great bar on the Lower East Side. If you were in New York, definitely check it out. Um, these shirts that say this is a movie about space wizards intended for children are available in our merch store. There's a link in the description. You can support this channel on Patreon where you will also get access to early announcements about videos, our Discord server, live stream Q&As, a bunch of stuff like that. So go check that out. Listen to the podcasts, the Infinity Podcast and Can't Get Enough of Keanu. Links in the description, of course. New episodes every single week. We have a subreddit, r slash thrillums, where you can talk about the videos or movies or whatever. So go check that out. Uh, so go check that out, and I think that is everything. I think that's the end of the video now. We'll have another one next week. Wow, I can't believe it. I better get to work. Uh, I'll see you then.